Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today, we hear about the crucifixion of Jesus. The scriptures we study are found in Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 56. To follow along with the life notes, you can download them now from the web at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. Luke 23 is your text. And uh, if you're looking at the life notes trying to figure it out, we uh, uh, inadvertently left out the chapter in your life notes. It's Luke 23. You could probably get that if you look down at the, some of the references. But uh, if you don't have your Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then may I encourage you, if you're at our Sweetwater campus, to grab one of the Bibles and the seats around you. If you're at our Parker campus, then uh, at a table in the back, there's some Bibles stacked on it. You can get up right now and go grab one of those Bibles. Anyone who's getting one can turn to page 1050. 1050, you'll be able to follow along in Luke chapter 23 with us. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, ask for one. We will get you one because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I want to uh, just mention a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, next week is uh, Easter, and, and we're excited about celebrating. I know all, all of you that are at our uh, Saturday service you know, at Sweetwater, you guys are just keep coming on Saturday. It's all good. If you want to come early at 3.30, that's fine. Uh, Easter and Parker, you guys are all geared up for one service. It's the last time you'll have one Easter service in a building because you guys are going to be in your new building soon and can't wait for that to have ha happen. And so next Easter, you guys will have like four or five services, whatever it takes. Uh, and that'll be great. Uh, I also wanted you to, to know, uh, just to update you, it's been a month since we uh, concluded our Limitless campaign. We're up to $3.3 million pledged, $200,000 already given in the first month, and uh, praise God for that. We are moving uh, forward on our, our phase one, which is to finish paying off the Parker Campus remodel and uh, to start on the mezzanine here at uh, the Sweetwater Campus. And then I just, uh, I'm going to mention it uh, this week and probably next week, but uh, as we're wrapping up our journey to Easter, and that is in 2025, we're taking a group to the Holy Land. If you would like to go, if it's on your bucket list, uh, you can sign up. There's brochures available. Grab one of those at the Connection Centers. Uh, I'll be happy to take you with us. We're going to go in November of 2025. And, uh, and if, you, if you want more information, it's available, or just email me, and we'll be glad to get back with you. Hey, you know, one of my uh, core convictions is that we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. We can't do it. And, and in fact, I believe one reason for powerless churches in America is that we try to speak for Jesus, we try to represent Jesus when our character or our attitude and our actions look nothing like Jesus. And, and so people just shut us out, don't listen to us, uh, and that begs the question, how do we know if our character represents Jesus? And I believe that our character is revealed uh, during crisis. Now, you know, a lot of people say, well, crisis builds character. I think crisis is revealed, uh, or character is revealed by crisis. And, and, uh, and so when life squeezes you, uh, you know, kind of what comes out? Yeah, like we deal with stress, pressure, adversity. We don't get what we want. Our lives fall apart. And then what's inside of us comes spilling out. So it's kind of like people are like donuts. I don't, you don't really understand that, so I'm going to show you what I mean. Uh, you can't really tell what's inside of us unless you're squeezed. And, uh, and, and so we have here, you guys like donuts? How many of you like donuts? Okay. Uh, so we have here three donuts. You can't tell what's inside of them, can you? They're all filled with something. Uh, they're filled with lemon, with raspberry, and with cream. How, how many of you uh, like lemon donuts, lemon-filled donuts? Okay. How, how many of you like raspberry better? How many of you like cream-filled? Okay, see, a lot of... All right. Let me just ask this question. I'm just going to go with the lemon, okay? Because that's really easy. To... How many of you think Jesse is the, has the lemon donut? 
No, nobody does. Nobody, nobody raise their hands. Nobody's for Team Jesse. How many think Scott has the lemon donut? Yeah. Oh, okay, Scott. How about Patrick? How many think Patrick has the lemon donut? Okay, I don't know who has the lemon donut. And because and I can't tell until they squeeze it. So gentlemen, would you please, uh, Jesse, would you squeeze your donut? Oh, is it? Oh, wrong direction. It's coming out. He's raspberry. All right, Scott, you want to squeeze your donut? Hopefully it squeezes better. Oh, that looks like lemon. All right, Patrick, what you got? You got cream, don't you? Oh, there it is. How many of you are offended that we just destroyed those donuts? All right, well, if your feelings are hurt about the donuts, we have donuts for you afterwards. Okay, are you guys happy about that? You may have to hurry to get out because I don't know if we have enough for everybody to have donuts. But anyway, we, uh, we have those. So, th see, when we're under pressure, our character is revealed. So today's challenge is this. What's inside of you? What's inside of you? When life squeezes you, what comes out? And what we're looking at is the most difficult moments of Jesus' life, the crucifixion. Uh, and, and we're looking at that because the character of Jesus is revealed on the cross. The character of Jesus is revealed on the cross. Uh, chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 32, says two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he really is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the others rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. The first character trait we see revealed in Jesus is mercy. It's mercy. Verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They know not what they do. Jesus prays for his tormentors and his accusers. Jesus prays for the people who are inflicting the pain on him. And by the way, these people certainly knew what they were doing. I mean, the soldiers were professional executioners. They did crucifixions in mass. They knew what they were doing. They were skilled at it. They didn't care about Jesus. They just went about their jobs. They didn't care if he was innocent or guilty. They, they just did what they did. The religious leaders who were mocking him, who were challenging him, if you really are the son of God, come off the cross, then we'll believe in you. No, they knew what they did. They knew that they had railroaded an innocent man. And yet Jesus forgives them. Hmm. Hey, when someone hurts you, what is your immediate reaction? How, how many, yeah, okay, hurt him back, thank you. I was gonna say, am I the only one who wants to hurt him back? <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of like a revenge reaction, isn't it? You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you, but not Jesus. 
in the midst of the pain that they're inflicting, he offers mercy, he offers compassion, he offers grace. Father, forgive them. They really don't understand what they're doing. Um, first of all, Jesus wanted them to receive mercy. And Jesus wants all of us to receive mercy because that's what's inside of him. He wants us to know that we are forgiven. I mean, that's why he died to pay for our sins. On that cross, he became sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That, that, there, this amazing thing happened on the cross where Jesus took all of our sin on himself and he gives us his righteousness so that we are forgiven. So have you received the mercy that Jesus offers? Have, have you come to that place in your life where you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sin. You believe that he was raised from the dead and you have made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Okay, well, good. Um, because that's why he came. Now, if you've done that, and most of you say that you have, uh, you know, I'm just gonna ask, have you confessed that in baptism? Baptism is that declaration to the world that I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus. Yes. I mean, okay, so a lot of you have, but I'm, uh, I'm talking to people who can't say yes right now, okay? So <laughs> if you have, way to go. Uh, so, but if you haven't, and you, yet you know that Jesus is your Savior, you know your sins are forgiven, you know that you, he's your Lord and Savior, then tell the world. And, and you don't get to tell the world your way, you tell the world his way by getting in the waters in front of a bunch of people and getting baptized. I, I got to do a baptism this week at, at a pe people's house. They said, hey, would you come and baptize uh, me and my husband? And I was like, sure. And they had a bunch of friends over and we celebrated. We'll do that. Or, hey, next week is Easter. What, a bet, ted, what better time to tell the world that you're a faithful follower of Jesus than on the day that we celebrate life in Jesus? So sign up, uh, grab a Connect card, call us, we, or come see us afterwards. We'll sign you up today. But uh, if you haven't yet confessed Jesus as your Savior, what are you waiting for? I mean, you know, do you, do you need more details? Do you need to understand better? Do you not quite grasp yet that the Son of God loves you and gave his life for you and wants to redeem you and wants you to spend eternity with him, wants you to have an existence that is better than anything in this world. And, and, and if you understand that, then what are you waiting for in terms of surrendering to him and saying yes? And, and if you've never done that, we would love to talk with you, pray with you, encourage you. Uh, prayer team members will be here at the front after the service. Please come up and talk to them. Or, or find one of the pastors and just say, hey, I wanna to talk to you about Jesus. At least fill out a Connect card. Let us follow up with you and talk with you on your terms when you're ready. Uh, but we'd love for you to receive the mercy that Jesus offers because when life squeezed Jesus, mercy was revealed. And he wants us to receive that mercy and Jesus wants us to forgive like he forgave because he's the example, we're the followers. So now I have to ask, do you delight in giving grace? See, it's delightful to receive grace, isn't it? <laughs> Some of you are like, yes. Yeah. Some of you are like, eh. Look, like, I don't know about you, but the best thing at all of all is when you receive grace and you go, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was guilty and now I'm forgiven. I, I mean, I've been exonerated of all the things I've done wrong. And, and that is the best thing. So you delight in, in receiving grace, but do you delight in giving others the grace that you have received? You know, one of our core values here at Calvary is uncomfortable grace, that we want to give to others the same incredible, unfathomable grace that we have received. I mean, the grace of God is unlimited and so we wanna give it out to others. So are you more comfortable giving grace or are you more comfortable offering judgment and condemnation? See, uh, many churches are excellent at teaching mercy and giving judgment. Anyone ever attended one of those? <laughs> That's, some of you have, others are like, I can't raise my hand, I'll get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> see, it, it's just, it's reality. We understand it, but it's so much easier to talk about grace than it is to actually give grace. It's so much 
easier to talk about being forgiven than it is to talk about I need to forgive others, especially those that have really hurt us. So churches are excellent at teaching mercy and giving judgment, but we can do better than that. And sometimes churches and Christians act like grace needs to be rationed, like God might run out, like, oh, we have enough grace for this sin, but not that one. We have enough grace for you people, but you people, nah, you're out of luck. And 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 a lot of times it just depends on whether we like somebody or whether uh, they've hurt us or whether or not, uh, because, you know, if you've hurt my friend then or somebody I don't really care about, then we got grace for you. But if you've hurt me and my family, I don't know if God has enough grace for you. See, and, and that's not how Jesus is. He gave grace. He gave grace to the people who are torturing him. I mean, he's just crazy generous with mercy, offering it to the least deserving people. Jesus' half-brother, the apostle James, said mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So how would your life be different if you chose mercy over judgment? If you chose mercy over condemnation or critique? How would mercy impact your marriage? See, every time I talk about this, I I just want you to get this idea of practice preemptive grace in your marriage. When you wake up tomorrow morning, when you wake up in the morning, then just, just, just pray this, God, help me to give grace to my spouse before they do something annoying. Okay? Seriously. If you think about that, you're, what you're doing is you're giving grace before it is needed. You know they're going to need grace because you've lived with them long enough. And, and so just decide. And then when that, and when that here's what's going to be really cool. If you mean that when you pray that, when that incident happens, you're going to be like, I've already forgiven it. It's good. And, and you're not going to get angry. You're not going to get upset. You're not going to respond out of line. And so just practice preemptive grace. It'll change your marriage. How would mercy impact your children if you weren't the queen of critique all the time? How would mercy impact your friendships? Wait, how would mercy impact your enemies? Maybe you'd have less. You see, they squeezed Jesus and mercy and grace flowed out. And on the cross, Jesus not only demonstrated mercy, but he demonstrated hope. Hope. Verse 43, he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Two thieves, two totally different attitudes. Well, it ended up that way, but all the other gospels just talk about the two thieves and how they just railed against Jesus and said these nasty things to Jesus. So they both started off, you know, teasing, you know, uh, critiquing, yelling at him, you know, hey, they ridiculed him, save yourself and us if you're the Messiah, go ahead and have it. But somewhere in that day, as they saw Jesus and as they heard Jesus and as they watched Jesus, one of those thieves had a change of heart. And he gets to that place where he rebukes his fellow criminal and, and he says, look, we're getting what we're deserved, but he doesn't deserve it. And he asked for mercy from Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that is an audacious request, isn't it? Here's a guy who hasn't done anything good He's being condemned and, and murdered. He even admits he's guilty. And, and, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He can't do anything for Jesus. He can't do anything for the kingdom of God. He just asks for mercy. And what does Jesus respond with but the promise of hope? Today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. So a criminal Deserving of death is forgiven, and he can do nothing, nothing at all except ask for mercy. And again, I just gotta point out, God is crazy generous with grace. He has enough for a thief hanging on a cross. You know what that means? That means that God has enough grace for you. Let me say that again. God has enough grace for even you. Because someone is sitting here Someone is joining us online. Somebody is listening to this that thinks, well, God can forgive other people, but he can't forgive me, not for what I've done, not for the way I've betrayed him, not for the way I've denied him, not for the the evil that I've engaged in. And I'm just telling you, yes, he can. There is enough grace for you, even you. And so he gives this dying man hope beyond this world. 
Today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, I've had, been around church people long enough that church people love to argue about stuff. All kinds of stuff. And so I've had some people say, well, you know, paradise, he didn't use the word for heaven there, so paradise maybe isn't heaven, and so the thief didn't get And I'm like, that is the dumbest argument ever. <laughs> I didn't use those words in that moment, I'm just telling you, but I'm using them now. Because see, here's, here's how this hits me. I don't care if you want to argue that paradise isn't heaven because Jesus said, you're going to be with me. With me. Hey, you want to go to heaven without Jesus? No. No, I, it's like, no, I'm going to be with Jesus. I don't care if it's paradise. I don't care if it's heaven. I don't care if it's bouse. All right? <laughs> I want to be with Jesus. All right? Call it what you want. That's the place I want to be. I want to be with my Savior. And we have hope beyond this world. That is the gospel promise. Jesus offered it to the thief, and he offers it to us. So here's the question. Are you living in the promise? Are you living in the promise? If you're a follower of Jesus, and most of you said you were, are you living with a strong conviction about eternity? Are you certain that one day you will be with Jesus? Okay, do you live knowing that heaven is your destiny and nothing in this world can change that? Okay, not enough, really, you're answering strongly enough. I hope, hey, Parker, I hope you guys answered a lot more enthusiastically on those questions. Okay, here's the thing. I believe that the thief died with a different attitude that day. I mean, he started off hopeless and angry, and yet he died hopeful and at peace. I mean, what a change. His hope was no longer in this life or in this world. His hope was in Jesus. When we live with the hope of eternal life, it changes our attitude and challenges our fears. Okay, let me say that again. When we live with the hope of eternal life, it changes our attitude, and it challenges all our fears. It challenges our fear of pain, because pain is temporary. The Apostle Paul said, I do not consider this present suffering worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? The pain today doesn't compare to how good it's going to be tomorrow. It, it, it challenges our fear of loss, so we're, look, we live terrified that the market's going to crash. We're going to lose all our investments. Our house is going to get foreclosed. Now we're going to lose all our stuff. Someone's going to break in and steal the stuff. I mean, we're just terrified of losing stuff. And guess what? You can't take any of it with you. And here's the thing. If you could, it would just be junk. Okay? It wouldn't be worth anything. Your prized possession in this world is worthless in heaven. Okay? Okay? There you go. Take your worthless junk with you and you'll be embarrassed, okay? You can't take it with you. Look, it changes our, our fear, it challenges our fear of death. You know, golly, people are so terrified of dying. And yet when you know that heaven is your eternal home, that that is what is waiting for you, there comes a point where you go, ah, I'm ready. Great, God, when, when you're ready. Can't wait to preach this tomorrow morning. Um, Eight o'clock service, man. Yeah, you gotta come. We're gonna have some fun with that one. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. If you believe that Jesus is your savior and he's taking you to heaven and you get a new body. Let me say it again. You get a new body. Is there any amens? Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, these old ones wear out. They get hurt. They get sick. They die. And the longer you live, guess what? The worse it gets. <laughs> God's just getting you ready for you to go like, please call my number next. You know? It, it, it's, but see, here's the thing. We're not afraid of death when we know that Jesus has our future and it only gets better. And Satan is trying to use these fears against us. He's trying to paralyze us with fear so we will not follow Jesus. And, and this is hard because we live in a culture that is obsessed with avoiding death. Hey, have you guys noticed that the safety Nazis have taken over? I mean, some of us grew up when life literally was free, and, and if you were dumb enough, you didn't live to see adulthood. <laughs> you, you know, we all had friends, right? It's like, I mean, look, there's a lot of us that don't, still don't know how we can, you know, function since we didn't have helmets on our head until we were 21. But nowadays, you gotta be in a car seat until you're 18. 
I got warning labels on everything. Look, I, I remember buying, uh, I think it was my children, it might have been my grandkids, a Happy Meal toy, and I tried to open it, and it says on the bag, this bag is not a toy. That is not for the toddlers who can't read. If you're a parent and you don't know that a bag is not a toy, God help us all. Um, but we're, we're involved in this culture that is obsessed with, with st staying alive and, and they just wanna have longer lives. And what's the point of living longer if you're consumed by worry and anxiety? Followers of Jesus are called to live differently. We are a people of hope. We're a people of hope. We don't have to fear death. Jesus defeated death on the cross. Heaven is our final destination so we can live boldly. We can live courageously. We can live fearlessly with a purpose to serve the living God. And if we do that, it's going to be attractive and appealing to people who are living without hope. So today, where is your hope? In the things of this world or is it in Jesus? See, when life squeezes you, what comes out? Fear or faith? Fear or hope? See, when they squeezed Jesus, hope was revealed. And then on the cross, Jesus demonstrated trust. Verse 46, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus trusted his father. He trusted his father. With his plan, with his pain, with his life, Jesus trusted the Father. Now remember, Jesus didn't want to die. It was only hours before that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And at this point, when the will of God is being done in the life of Jesus so that we could be redeemed from hell, Jesus says, Father, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my pain. I trust you with my death. And he declared that faith publicly in his father. So the question to us becomes, will you walk in faith when you can't see the way? We walk in faith when you can't see the way. God invites us to trust him. And that should be so easy. It seems ridiculous that we would doubt the God who loved us enough to save us and promises us life eternal. But we do all the time. We do all the time, which is why we can read God's word but not do God's word because we're not sure that it's gonna work if we actually do what God says. And yet we need faith. We need trust if we're gonna thrive in this life following Jesus. In fact, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God wants us to trust him with the little things and the big things. Some of us think we can handle the little things and we'll just hold on to God and the big things. But can I tell you this? We need to trust God in the little day-to-day -day obedience things because that's practice for the big things. And when we practice daily obedience to God, when we say, God, I'm gonna trust you even though I really don't wanna forgive this person, but you said to forgive and, and that's for me, so I'm gonna forgive them. God, I don't really don't wanna obey at this point in terms of fighting against my lust, but I'm gonna do that because you say you're gonna bless me if I do that. God, I really don't wanna obey at this point. Whatever point that is, you don't wanna obey, but you do anyway. You say, God, I'm gonna obey you because I trust you that my life is gonna be better. Then you will have the faith to trust him in the tragedies and trials of life. If you don't trust God in the little things, trust me, you won't trust God in the big things. So will you walk by faith, especially when you have no idea where God is leading or how God is working? See, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question because we have to trust God with next. We have to trust God with our next decision. We have to trust God with our next point of obedience. By the way, I think every one of us has a point of obedience that the Holy Spirit right now is like nudging us going, hey, you know what I want you to do. Are you going to trust God with the next point of conviction and repent? Are you, because at some point, like Jesus, we're going to experience death. It's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And if we want to be at peace, if we want to be able to trust God in that moment, we need to practice trusting God right now, every day, over and over again until we leave this world. So trust God with your marriage. Trust God with your children. Trust God with your relationships. Trust God with your money. Trust God with your education, with your business, with your fears, with your pain, with your failures. Trust God with your loss. 
trust him. And let people know that you're trusting him. Jesus died with a shout of faith. We will too if we live a life trusting God. So Jesus was squeezed by the crucifixion. And what he revealed was trust and hope and mercy. What does your life reveal under pressure? Now, if you don't like the answer, you can ask Jesus to change you. And he wants to because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your mercy because we need it. We fail you so often and we just confess that. Uh, We need your grace because we're sinners. We need your grace because we're rebels. So thank you for the mercy that flows from Jesus to us because like those people, we know what we're doing but we keep doing it anyway. Father, thank you for the hope that you give us. Fill our lives with that expectation of eternal life so that we can live differently, so that we can live in a way that, that points to you and your salvation as make, being a difference maker in our lives. And Father, we really do wanna trust you. You reveal your truth to us in the word of God and so often we balk at following you. So God, give us that measure of faith that we need to take that step in trust following you. Whatever that next step is, God, we commit ourselves to you. So Lord, that's our prayer. We want our character to reflect Jesus. Help us to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's message, the squeezed donuts were meant to illustrate our character being revealed under pressure. When you are stressed and your character is on display, are you pleased with how you behave? Or do difficult circumstances show your need for a savior? I hope you recognize Jesus is the savior we need. If you have questions about today's message, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. One of our pastors will respond to you and pray for you. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a great week and join us again next week for Easter. Bye-bye. I'm Pastor Zach Papuga from Calvary, Phoenix, and I want to invite you to this year's Zona Men's Retreat. The goal and the purpose of this retreat is to get guys from all ages and all walks of life together to have an intentional time to talk about what it means to be a man of God in today's world. This year's theme will be the King's Men. We're going to take a deep dive into David's mighty men together, and that will be led by lead pastor Chad Garrison of Calvary Baptist Lake Havasu. So we want to invite all of you men to join us April 26th through 28th up at Young Life's Lost Canyon Camp in Williams, Arizona. At the camp, there are tons of activities and opportunities for you and the guys to connect and have tons of fun. The cost for this amazing retreat is $190, and that includes your meals, the content, all the activities, and your lodging for the whole weekend. You can register today for this incredible retreat at AZ mn.org slash men. If you register before April 1st, you can get one of these incredible King's Men shirt to wear up at the retreat. So men, we hope to see you April 26th up at Lost Canyon. Don't miss it.